Ah, the smell of grease paint, the roar of the crowd. All of the world's a stage, and the men and women, merely players. Welcome to Making History Live. I'm Megan Lawrence. And I'm Milan House. Today's electronic field trip will take us behind the scenes of Colonial Williamsburg Historic Area to discover how performers is used to teach history. As with any kind of historical interpretation, historical performance must be backed up by thorough research. I focus today on programs that interpret the lives of Williamsburg free blacks and enslaved populations will reveal the challenges of researching people who left behind little, if any, written record. It's easy to see how watching a play would be an entertaining way to learn about history. It could be a modern play written about historic events, or it could be a play that was written in the past and performed today for a modern audience to show what people back then found entertaining. Either way, we learn about history. Music can also be used to inform us about the past. Listening to the same music your ancestors listened to might be as close as you come to actually sharing an experience with them. Music is like a time machine for our senses. In the African American music program we'll visit, rhythm and music familiar to the 18th century enslaved people will come to life. Just like a stage play, this form of performance presentation puts the audience in the role of engaged observer. Another type of performance that we'll investigate is character portrayal, also called first person interpretation. This way of presenting history requires the performer to have a thorough understanding of the time period in which that character lived. Portraying someone from the first person requires the interpreter to stay in character while carrying on conversations on a variety of historical topics. And it's more than just knowing about the topic, you have to know how that particular character will feel about the topic. And those feelings have to be historically accurate and interpretively significant. What we mean is, you can't just make stuff up because then you're not interpreting history. You're just making stuff up. And by interpretably significant, we mean, why does the character say this or that? This is important in all historical performance, of course, but the character interpreter needs to constantly be considering how what they're saying is teaching history. We'll visit Revolutionary City, where the lines between character portrayal and stage performance are all but erased. We'll track one of the emotionally charged scenes from that program as it goes from script writing committee to rehearsal, and finally, to public performance. So join us behind the scenes as we discover the exciting world of historical performance in Making, Making History, History Live. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. understand history uh, because you can't really talk about uh, enslavement of the African people without talking about their cultures, their uh, music, their stories, their dancing. The music is the one thing, the one tool they could use to communicate. Even when they couldn't speak the same language, they could still use the music to communicate with one another because the music, it broke that communication barrier. go through not as a spectator, but you go through the program as a participator because this program is very participatory. Um, you are engaged by the cast members. So if we actually try to make you become a part of the community once the program starts. They have to audition, and they have to have uh, some musical talent. They don't have to have a lot. They don't have to be Broadway singers in any way. They just have to have a passion for performing and a passion uh, for telling the story of the enslaved individuals, as well as be willing to wear a costume, because when you put on that costume, we, you really go back in time. And there are certain elements of this program where you know, you're know you presenting yourself as an enslaved individual, and you have to retell that story as best as you can. So you have to be willing to sing, to dance and put on that costume and just give it 100%.
Within the songs, you find the history, and within the dance, you find the emotion of the slaves and how they felt. I've had guests that actually came from Ghana, and when we sang the song Ogun, the lady uh, cried, and she said, going back generations in her family, the way we sang Ogun Day was true to the way she, it was sung in her homeland. I think performing it and for folks seeing it live, it is the best way to present it because we are telling a story uh, for folks who can no longer tell it for themselves, especially during that time period, so that they can understand how the music was used to help these enslaved individuals survive the institution of slavery. A little bit of sorrow because um, some of the things that they went through were tough. This was a place where they could get and gather to have family and sometimes family were taken away from them and you feel that in the show. To get away from all the hurt and pain, they came here and they got with their families. I just want them to walk away knowing that my ancestors had like hard times but they got through it, you know, right with family and with love. I want the guest experience uh, to be when they leave here, I want them to leave with the understanding, knowing uh, why the music was used within this community, how it was used, there was a purpose for the singing, and no one was just singing for the sake of singing. They're singing because the songs had meaning to them. Uh, even though they were coming empty-handed, they were not coming empty-headed, so they were keeping a part of them that was African, and it was coming out of them through music. It is said in Africa that uh, those that are remembered are never truly dead. And if you keep this uh, story and this history alive in your minds, uh, this will never truly die either. And what better way to remember any people than by the culture, uh, what does inspire them, what they love, and in fact, what makes them, them. Most people, it takes them a minute, but you did a great job with the dance. I think the benefits of having adults and uh, children in this program is the fact that when the guests come here, they see a real community as best as we can recreate it. So by the guests seeing um, the adults and children in their costume, it, it just really bring it more to life for them than ever before. They play to learn the rhythm of work. Revolutionary City is, a, is an experience where we bring to life the people and the events of the 18th century that was instrumental to the struggle to become American. And this is a question that I had when I, when I was talking with the staff. So, um, and when I talked with Christina in particular, um, she sent me a text message when I sent this to her. And she said, um, why, did James and George, why is it that James and George don't like each other? Most uh, enslaved people in the 18th century are, aren't writing biographies, uh, autobiographies. Um, a, a lot of the African history is oral. So a, a lot of things changed, a lot of things have gotten lost even just in translation and conversations. And to be able to, to find a, 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 a document to be able to bring all of these characters together is just it's just not there. 
we all know you two don't like each other. Well, I want that to have been revealed. I, I, I think that's going to be pretty obvious. I would cut that line, right. okay? We have a script team that reviews the scripts, uh, which consists of drama experts, historians, and several other folks from outside of our Clinton Williamsburg Foundation who have a keen interest in ensuring that we are historically responsible with the scene that we present so that we have the, 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 the accuracy and the authenticity um, but take into account that there are some things that we, that we don't know. And so we can justify the decisions that we made for the characters and the story that we put together. They are being looked over by Mr. Harwood right now as we speak. What if he decided to buy them and not me? I was just um, excited about being a part of a, a new script that had so much passion and, and, um, and you know, feeling in it. And it gets people to think and feel of what it must have been like for these slaves to have to know that their fate is coming about any moment a rehearsal is called and we come together for the first time. Uh, and that is pretty much the first time we get to hear each other's voices, how they're going to um, present their lines, their body language, all of that. And so you kind of get a feel for the person that's doing, you know, the character. Uh, of course, you get direction from the director, but you still have to internalize it. Phoebe, come now, why don't you just go on and sit yourself down? There's no need in worrying on things. No need in worrying? Hannah, just listen to yourself. We are about to be sold off and... Are you talking about no need to worry? As they gonna do what they gonna do. Now you worrying on things ain't gonna change it a bit. Lord, come Lord, now, Lord. I just feel better if the children were here. I wish they would bring them to me. I can tell you right now, there's nobody going to buy all for you. Hannah? George, now you do no good by scaring the poor girl to death. When you get those scripts that actually have an impact, they actually hit you, like this one did, uh, across the face in a wonderful way, it makes you, it, it affects you, it makes you happy to know that these sort of depictions that show it in a in, in a tone that might be a little, make you a little nervous. It's great. Time grows short. You need to talk to them when they bring them back. I don't know what to say to them. Digging into myself as an actor and being able to imagine what if I did have children and they were taken away from me, how would I react? And uh, another challenge that comes with that would be the whole stereotypical reactions. I'm, trying to conjure up a reaction that isn't your, I guess, typical sobbing, wailing African-American woman, but at the same time, that's, that's what I find myself wanting to do. Never on the block. Oh, Lord. <laughs> James. <laughs> Lord. What they done to you? I see they haven't hanged what? you too no. bad, no. George. I'm tired of you. I'm, I'm going to kill him. I'm tired of him. Stop I'm going to kill him, George. I'm going to kill him. Stop it. Just stop it. Now is not the time. Uh, when I read the script, it's one of the few that seem to uh, encompass a lot of different emotions. There's a lot of up and down. You have some anger and some hope and some sadness and some faith. And so, I mean, it's, it's a lot going on with uh, the scene in general and each character individually that uh, really just um, causes a lot to go on and a lot of things to think about within that, that short frame, uh, frame of time. Lift up my shirt. Go ahead. Back in January. You know, facial expression and, and body language uh, and tone of voice, all of those things I use to convey realness to the audience. They can hear nothing I'm saying. They should still be able to understand how I'm feeling just the way my face is and the way my body moves as well. But now it's like they did with the governor's cattle. Oh. I found it very, very moving. I, it, it was pretty intense. 
I think they can see the harsh reality that was. You know, you read about it, but you don't really get a feel for it until somebody puts you in the middle of it. You're not just looking at a picture. You're actually seeing it reenacted. And so you can actually kind of see some of the emotion on their faces. The engagement of the storyteller, that there's, there's that aspect of having a relationship with the audience. It gives you a chance to not only hear about what might have happened, but to see, to see it portrayed in a human interaction. I felt very much like I was there listening to this conversation, that I could have actually been involved in it. Where, where are my are children? Doing? They're so oh. <laughs> Performance offers a face. Performance offers an emotion. Performance offers a different way of teaching history that allows you to become part of that moment in time. I want a broad perspective of it. I don't want just a single perspective, just a just man, Gowan, but Gowan's world. I mean, when Gowan's walking around, what did he see? You know, the library is my best resource in understanding some of the things about taverns. Gowan Pamphlet was born in the King's Arms Tavern, and what I want to do is get information as much as I can about the tavern business. And you never know what kind of questions people are going to ask you, so let me see what we have in here that can be very helpful for him. The records that we show, you know, most of the time it talks just about a cook and how research can take that information and then tie it in with another information and then come up with this cook person that we see in this record in, you know, 17... 82 at the apothecary, the cook of George With, not being named Lydia, but later on we see the name of Lydia Brodnick so that we can put the two together. I'm actually reading this book about George With. Since I portray Lydia, who's George With's cook, it's really interesting to find out things about his timeline of things that he did in his life. These were things that Lydia would have known. You know, costumes are very, very important. It helps me to get into character. Oh, hey, Valerie. Hey, Tom. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Good, thanks. <laughs> this is Tom. He helps me with costumes. You don't get a lot of, you know, mental pictures of a uh, African American in the 18th century <laughs> in costume. The costume is very, very important for. Uh, understanding his role in the community. Now I'm going to be twisting it, so if you will twist this side. I think that's an automatic hook, and I think that, uh, you know, once you open your mouth and start speaking, they're automatically drawn in to what you have to say. Elders, our matriarchs, our ancestors have watched over us and taught us the things of faith. Can I have an amen? Yeah. Now, they especially like talking about the French, especially a man by the name of Montesquieu and another one by the name of Voltaire. Well, she's in the house of an educator. Why would there not be an influence, even if she's the cook? Why would there not be an influence on the talk in the house or even, you know, a library or a man that you know, was, was, was a scientist and know all the things that George With was, why would that not be an effect on who she is? When Joe got 200 lashes on his bare back, I saw his blood come out of his body and go into this here dirt. Some of the things are going to be very difficult because 
as I play Gowan, you know, some of the things he's going through, I've never, you know, I've never had a, you know, a, you know, someone lashing me. I've never had someone pushing upon me, you know, you know. So I mean, these things are going to happen to you, you know. So you, you're not going to be in your comfort zone all the time. I appreciate all of your prayers and support that you have given us. Citizen of this nation and not a slave. I also know that there are those amongst us that ain't so sure this was the right thing to do. My master, George Wick, he says that a citizen is one who is entitled to the rights and privileges of a free man. Rehearsing my lines, it's always important to rehearse your lines before you go on to do a scene. That way your lines will always be fresh. A citizen and not a slave. So I have to tell you, when they's talking like that, I know they not meaning me and they not meaning you, Eve. Not at all, Lydia. You know, my master George Wick, he says that a citizen is one who is entitled to the rights and privileges of a free man. I've always got this conversation going on in my head <laughs> when I'm performing. So that's why I really, really rely on other people to say whether it worked or not. You had to go and get yourself seen so you could shout it in public. My wife, sister, we have known each other for a long time. Indeed. Everybody here knows how important that you are and how much you care for our people, as do I. The people we do here are real people. And so it's it's almost, you know, kind of you're kind of nervous in a way because you want to kind of get it right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know uh, and kind of honor them in your presentation of their story. So you really take, you know, pains to to try to to get it right. So when you are performing before the uh, the guests, they can get a glimpse maybe of how it could have been in the 18th century and 18th century city called Williamsburg. I did see Thomas Jefferson and George Washington as belonging to me. And it's so easy not to see Lydia because of that slavery and how we feel about race and that time period and the, the sadness and the horror of it all and we none of us want to want to claim that but in not claiming that we don't we don't claim the people if those men win their freedom from the king then me and eve we gonna get our freedom too and it is gonna be based on the words written in this declaration of independence because, ma'am, I want you to know that it is by the laws of nature, I'm talking nature's God, that all men are created. Honey, you understand what I'm saying? Created. Equal. I just really hope that people can see themselves in Lydia. I was there at the auction, holding George and seeing his new wife sold away from him. I heard her cries. Walk, believer, walk. Daniel. Walk, believer, walk. I think it's more legitimate now. And I think uh, anyone that's taken on this particular venture of, of doing first person, you need to be proud because you're helping our country and you're helping individuals, Americans, understand themselves a lot better.